For a long time, women have had to be fighting misogyny from without, but now men are fighting and struggling for motivation from within. And I do think that this, this motivation point is important, but we have to look at the structures and systems and norms and signals that, that cause us to be motivated. This doesn't come out thin air. Hello, I'm Jeff Cavaceres from the Niskanen Center. Welcome to the Vital Center podcast, where we try to sort through the problems of the muddled, moderate majority of Americans drawing upon history, biography, and current events. And I'm very happy to be joined today by Richard V. Reeves, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, where he directs the Future of the Middle Class Initiative and co-directs the Center on Children and Families. He is British by origin and was Director of Strategy to UK Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg from 2010 to 2012. His work at Brookings focuses on the middle class, education, and social mobility and is the author, most recently, of a book which will be released September 27, entitled Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why it Matters, and What to Do About It. So welcome, Richard. Thank you for being here. And first of all, congratulations on Of Boys and Men. It's a wonderfully written work, but it also makes a serious argument that the problems of boys and men are both real and dangerously neglected. Uh, I'd like to start by asking you how you came to the topic. You are best known for your scholarship on equality of opportunity with a focus on divisions of social class and race. But as you put it in the preface to your book, you've gone from being a dad worried about raising your three sons to a scholar worried about millions of boys and young men who are struggling in school, at work, and in the family. Can you tell me something about how you came to write about the subject of inequalities across gender as well as across social class and race? Sure. So, of course, you know, there is a, an autobiographical element to all scholarship. And I, I think it's as well to just recognize that uh, rather than deny it. And so, yes, I think the experience of raising three three boys, both in the UK and the US to adulthood, has made me more sensitive, perhaps, to the challenges, particularly of young men. They're all in their 20s now. But I should stress that you know those are from upper middle class backgrounds. They're, they're not the boys I'm most worried about, uh, except at a personal level. But it was the work on class and family and gender that I've long been interested in that sort of drew me to this subject. So I've done a lot of work, as you've mentioned, on inequality and class divisions. I've done a lot of work on race. But as I was looking at some of the trends around inequality, I kept stumbling across the, these big findings for how many men, many boys and men are really struggling in education, in work, and in the family. And those cut across lots of the other inequalities that I was focused on before around class and race. And so I, I came to see that gender inequality in the direction that you might not expect us to write about, which is, in other words, the gender inequalities where boys and men are on the downside uh, of the inequality is actually a, a really important part of the inequality debate and one that's not getting enough attention. And the, the deeper I dug, the the more worried I got <laughs> to the point where I, I decided that this was worthy of book-length treatment, and in particular, some discussion of some solutions. Because even to the extent the problem is acknowledged, there's very little out there in terms of, well, what do we do about it? Um, you also wrote in the preface that you were reluctant to write about this subject. Why was that? I was reluctant to write about it in this way, in, in, in such a straightforwardly focusing on the problems of boys and men way, because the politics of sex and gender, particularly in the US right now, are quite polarized. And so it's difficult to write about the, what I see as these real problems for boys and men without in some ways departing from a commitment to gender inequalities, to ca tackling gender inequalities the other way, right? You're faced with the false choice, essentially. So either you care about women and girls, in which case you're on the left, or you care about boys and men, in which case you're on the right, and basically just want to go back in time to, to the world, the world before feminism. Uh, and so even raising the problems of boys and men, and then having specific policies aimed at boys and men is, I think, a difficult task in our in our current environment. And so it was partly for that reason. And inevitably, there are, you know, you'll get attacks from both sides. But, but it was partly because I felt like there was this dangerous vacuum being created by the polarization, where it was becoming almost impossible for people of goodwill to just have a discussion about some of these problems facing boys and men without running the risk of being seen to have departed from their, their, their tribe in one way or another. Uh, I'm grateful to you for taking on this subject, uh, because although I don't have children of my own, I have a lot of friends who do, and they have seemed particularly worried about their sons. Um, and again, on an anecdotal level, but I remember 
that, oh, maybe a dozen years ago, I was a uh, guest teaching at American University here in DC. And the female male to ratio at the university was then close to 70 30. Uh, I don't know what, what extent that has changed or remained the same. But what was even more interesting was that the ratio of female to male accomplishment, if you want to put it that way, mm -hmm. was more like 95 to 5. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Women almost exclusively were graduating with honors, leading the clubs and societies on campus, and on a more prosaic level, just doing the assigned reading and speaking out in class. And the men were pleasant enough, but they were almost entirely disconnected from the educational process. And as far as I could tell, they seemed to spend most of their time smoking marijuana and playing video games. And at the time, I thought this was a consequence of the misbalanced gender ratio. Uh, they were sort of living in that paradise spoken of by the prophets Jan and Dean and their 1963 single Surf City in which there would be <laughs> two girls for every boy. Um, but your book has really made me appreciate that what I saw in that classroom was the consequence of deeper structural forces at work. And just uh, to address the educational imbalances, um, you have a newly launched substack entitled Of Boys and Men. Uh, and one of your early posts notes that in 1972, men were 13 points more likely, percentage points that is, mm -hmm. than women to get a bachelor's degree. And that's when Title IX was passed to help women. Now women are 15 percentage points more likely than men to get a bachelor's degree. So gender inequality in higher education is wider today than it was 50 years ago, but the other way around. Mm. Yeah, that's right. That's one of the, one of the facts, I think, that you you trip over on your and makes you think wow i mean i knew there was a gender gap in education it's not that's not a that's not a secret i think to anybody that's paying even passing attention to the trends but i didn't realize how wide the gap had gotten and how in many areas it really is accelerating and so yeah that fact that we have wider gender inequality today than when title IX was passed i think is a really important one to discuss and of course there's a reasonable discussion to be had about well why and how far does it matter and how far does it play out to the labor market and so on but the brute fact of that inequality i think should give us pause and then I think we should have to ask some hard questions as to what's going on there. And I, I appreciate the way you've made the distinction that I try to make very strongly between the individualization of this problem and looking for structural causes. And it's not to suggest that there aren't individual responsibilities here. This is an old debate, of course, between left and right, between individual agency and structural factors. But, but actually, weirdly, when it comes to boys and men, the left and right are in loud agreement <laughs> that it's an individual problem. It's just that, that they... They think the problem is different, right? So the left tend to view the problem of problem as being masculinity, as too much of it, it's too toxic, you just need to get it out. As I say, the left tells you be more like your sister. But the right say there's just not enough masculinity. These guys are lying around, you know, drink video games and pornography. If they just could be like man up and take on their masculine responsibilities, we'd be fine. So they're saying be more like your dad. But at both of them agree that it's at the level of the individual. And what I was really struck by, when I look at the education system, I don't think this is an individual problem. I think it's a structural problem. And in particular, the way the education system rewards certain kinds of outcomes, certain kinds of behavior, which are typically more, more to be found among girls and women, and also that boys just develop uh, later, just in terms of their brain science and, and brain development and non-cognitive. And so that puts them at a disadvantage, especially in high school. And so weirdly... The women's movement, by taking the brakes off women's educational advancement, has exposed a structural inequality in the education system, which disfavors boys and men. We have an education system that is more female friendly than male friendly. We just couldn't see that before because <laughs> the girls weren't going off to college. Now we can see it. And the gaps are pretty wide. And I will say the last thing on this is that when I've talked to people who, who were interested in these issues in the 60s and 70s, nobody predicted this overtaking. Everybody was focused on getting to equality. There isn't a single article or a single scholar that was saying, yeah, once girls catch up, they're going to keep going. And we're just going to see the gap getting wider and wider. And no one predicted it. Surprised everybody, but it's not really getting enough attention yet. I agree. Um, so the disparities between male and female accomplishment in education is pretty uh, obvious now. But you also note that there are some other top line problems facing men today. Uh, the wages of most men are lower today than they were in the 1970s, while women's wages have risen across the board. Uh, one in five fathers are not living with their children. Men account for two out of the three deaths of despair, either from suicide or overdose. Uh, 65,000 more men than women died of COVID in this pandemic. And you also note that many of these problems are compounded for boys and men who are on the receiving end of other forms of inequality, such as social class and race, with black men in particular, mm. facing not only institutional racism, but gendered racism. 
And uh, as you just said, the problems of boys and men are structural in nature, but rarely treated as such. Uh, as you put it in your book, boys are falling behind at school and college because the educational system is structured in ways that put them at a disadvantage. Men are struggling in the labor market because of an economic shift away from traditionally male jobs. And fathers are dislocated because the cultural role of family provider has been hollowed out. Yeah, I actually think the gap in deaths of despair is even probably a bit wider than you suggested. I think it's about a threefold difference in in the male female gap. The the economic fact again is an important one. I think the the fact that most men today earn less than most men did in 1979 is a very important economic fact. So if the, if American men, this is in the US, if American men were a nation and we were measuring, you know, measuring how well that nation was doing economically through their earnings. It'd be poorer today than it was four decades ago. That would be a rem- that's remarkable. It's remarkable to go backwards. I mean, it's one thing to not grow very much, but it's another to go backwards. Uh, and again, it's important to distinguish between the, the different classes because at the top, we have men at the top are earning more than men at the top did in 1979. But the male wage distribution in general has actually slid back a little bit. And that has all kinds of consequences for culture, for family formation, for men's prospects, and also for just how men feel about themselves, honestly. There is a sort of cultural element to it too. But then we've got to look at why. And it is some of these, you know, these shocks to the economy that have taken place through free trade, which I support, through immigration, which I support, but recognizing that there are some downsides to a lot of positive changes. And I think in general, our unwillingness sometimes to recognize the byproducts of some of these changes and tackle them properly has, has really left a lot of men on the sidelines. And then, and I think that plays out in family life too. And again, it's these working class men, especially men from the, the bottom of the economic distribution and black men are in no way could be described as patriarchs if patriarch means, patriarchy means anything now. And so it's really those men that I'm most concerned about and where I think the deepest problems lie. Um- I'd like to, if I could, uh, step back from the book for just a moment. Uh, and I wonder if you could tell me something about yourself, your background, early influences, how you came to the general subjects that you study. So I grew up in the UK, so you can probably tell. Uh, and I grew up in a, a, an industrial town just about about an hour north uh, of London. Um, my parents were upwardly mobile and had landed there because my, my father ended up working in manufacturing on the white collar side, having worked at Ford, uh, and actually was hit pretty hard in the manufacturing recessions of the 1980s, uh, to the extent that he actually was out of work for a while. And I think to some extent, I've been really influenced by my parents' upbringing in various ways. Their upward mobility, uh, I think, was one of the things that really motivated some of my work around inequality. And that sense of, you know, the sense of anger that, that I inherited, I think, at any barriers that were put in front of people by class, gender, race, and so on. But I also think that it's now clearer to me that both as a father myself, but also as a scholar, just you know, watching my father um, be a father uh, from his generation where his bedrock responsibility was, was breadwinning and then to be unemployed um, twice. And, and when he was first unemployed, actually every day getting up and putting on his tie, shirt and tie. Uh, and shaving and then going into the spare room to bash out resumes to get a job. And I remember him saying to me, my job now is to get a job. Uh, and he also taught us to swim and, you know, all this, all the other stuff that fathers do uh, and mothers, I should say, too. But uh, uh, so I think it was a modeling for me, too. But it also made me realize both the kind of upsides and downsides of the traditional male role model. But what I very strongly felt was he was uh, he was a father as a core part of his identity. And that's that's, I think, influenced me quite strongly as I've worked on this book. What was that industrial town where you grew up? It was called Peterborough. Uh, so I had a big uh, a factory there called ba- Baker Perkins. A lot of agricultural uh, work too. I worked in a frozen pea factory as a as a teenager. My mum was actually a night nurse at one of the fac- factories for a while, um, which makes it all sound a little bit more sort of Dickensian than it was. But we were an affluent family by most people's um, by most people's standards. But um, but very much a kind of you know a, a, a sort of what Americans would call a middle class town. Uh, voted for Brexit quite strongly in the Brexit referendum, which is always a good test of like what kind of constituency was it. Um, so yeah, just a, an hour north of London. But then I I, uh, I left from there to go into university, and then I zigzagged between journalism, politics, uh, 
uh, academia and think tanks for for uh, all of my time in the UK and actually ended up working the coalition government for Nick Clegg as his director of strategy. So I do, I've done my dose of politics uh, and I worked for the first Blair government as well, actually. So I've done I've done I've, I've dabbled in politics for a few years here and there. I uh, took a master's degree at Cambridge University, so I actually went to Peterborough a few times. It was a good music town at that point. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, and it has, a, it has a beautiful cathedral as well, so it's, it a, it's a genuinely kind of mixed mixed town. Lots of immigration. I, I think the school I was at was, I think it's now 50%, but it was at least it was very high proportion of Pakistani uh, immigrants, kids at uh, the school, so very, very racially mixed at that time. That had been after a big uh, immigration wave from, uh, obviously, from the Asian subcontinent on too. So but mixed in all kinds of interesting ways. And was that a school that we here in the United States would refer to as a public school? Uh, yes, it was, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, very large, what we call a comprehensive school, and mixed on, mixed in all kinds of ways. And I think this influenced my, my, my work too, because it was comprehensive. It took, actually, a lot of the kids from um, who uh, were of Pakistani origin lived nearer to another school, but it was a Church of England school. Um, and at that time, you had to be you had to be in the Church of England to go to that school. So they all came to our school. Plus, we had a a center for disabled kids at the school, partly because it was on one level, which meant the kids in wheelchairs could be there. And we took quite a lot of students who'd been in juvenile um, services too. And so it was actually genuinely very, very mixed on all kinds of dimensions. And then there were kids like me from kind of pretty affluent backgrounds and had an incredibly strong like orchestra and deba debating team, which was done at lunchtime, which is one of the things that actually you know got me away to university was I discovered that I loved debating uh, and here I am still doing it. Uh, were you unusual in your comprehensive school in going on to Oxford? Yeah, I think I was only this. I, th I think I was the third to go, the third from my school to go there, uh, to go to either Oxford or Cambridge. And uh, I don't think many have been since. So yeah, it was it was pretty unusual. I think I was there at quite an unusual period in the school's history. And, and weirdly, it was only because uh, a girl who was a bit older than me, Sarah Shake, uh, who went to Oxford to do law, she told me to come visit her. And I went to visit her and sort of my head was turned and I went back and actually started working. And uh, and I actually managed to follow in her footsteps, but it was only that personal connection. I knew her through the debating team. So it was a teacher set up a lunchtime debating club, which we loved. And I did it with Sarah. Sarah Sheikh went off to university and she, she basically almost forced me to go visit her. And I visited her and um, you know she, she, she's really the reason that I went to Oxford. Which college were you at there? I was at Wadham College. Mm -hmm. So its main claim to fame, as far as I am aware, is that it has the most symmetrical front quad. In Oxford. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that I'll get uh, hounded by my fellow Wadhamites for saying that, but but I do remember that about it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and how did you experience uh, Oxbridge, if you want to put it that way? Um, I I enjoyed it greatly. Uh, it was another interesting moment for me in terms of thinking about social class, because which has animated a lot of my work, because. The it was I think at least at that time most of the kids probably a bit more than fifty percent were from private schools, as opposed to um, state schools or public schools, and and very few from the sort of school that I was coming from. And so in that sense, it, it, it was it was a bit of an adjustment. But one of the things I actually discovered was that you know the really posh kids were generally fine. I mean, they actually you know they were perfectly you know, nice people. And I found the inverse snobbery of the other kids from working class backgrounds more annoying. You know, they came with this massive chip on their shoulder. And there's this great line from Tracy Emin, the British artist. Um, she says, one of my problems is that the chip on my shoulder hasn't noticed how successful I am now. <laughs> and and I really felt that oh, there's all these working class kids that sort of carried their working class back credentials around with them. like, And they just continue to be, and I was looking at them saying, you're at Oxford. Right, you at some point the chip surely the chip has to start shrinking a little bit, and I made great friends with people who've been to Eton and you know various other people, and so in that sense, I found I find inverse snobbery almost as toxic as snobbery um, because it's the same thing; it's the same writing off of certain people because of their backgrounds um, rather than treating them as an individual rather than looking the person in front of you in the eye and saying you know, what kind of person is this? So I think that's had quite a, that did have quite a big influence on the way I think about these things. I encountered that same kind of working class chip on the shoulder phenomenon at Cambridge, although confusingly, really posh people like at King's College also affected all sorts of working class style glottal stops. So sometimes it was a bit hard to tell who was who. 
People pretend it. Well, Blair did that as well, of course. You know, it became sort of a <laughs> thing to... And I didn't sound like this when I went to Oxford, I will, I will say. So you were at King's. Is that where, where you were studying? No, I was actually at Jesus College. Um, oh, you were at Jesus, yeah. But, uh, but King's was by far the, the poshest uh, thing going at Cambridge at that time, at any rate. Right, but also if you switch countries, then the accent confuses people anyway. That's true, too. Um, so how did you classify yourself politically back then? Because you did go to work for Nick Clegg, who was a liberal Democrat and liked to call himself a radical centrist. So of course, that's interesting to me. Um, but I'd just be curious to know how you considered yourself politically then and now, for that matter. Yeah, that's what uh, that's my journey. I, I actually was, I would have considered myself to be Labour. I worked for a, a Labour think tank. And Demos. Labels not, no. no, actually, I worked for the Institute for Public Policy Research with David uh. Miliband, David Miliband, Ed Miliband, Patricia Hewitt, various people. And so I was very much in the new Labour crowd. And then when um, Blair won in 97, I went in to work for Frank Field, who was Blair's Minister for Welfare Reform um, for a while. And that was in between uh, working for the Guardian and the Observer newspaper, but all through that period, I would describe myself as Labour, and I was very Blairite. So, to, the, to that extent, I was very much on the, on the Blairite side of the of the Labour divide all along. So, in that sense, could pretty cent, pretty centrist, even at that point. So, I, then I spent many years writing a biography of John Stuart Mill, and one of the results of that was to make me realise that I really was a liberal, and that. Uh, sufficiently so that it wasn't enough to try and stay within the Labour Party and be a liberal within the Labour Party, but that it was time, particularly under Nick Clegg's leadership, to um, become a Liberal Democrat. And so when I became the director of Demos, the think tank over there, I I did a lot of work in this space. Um, Nick actually you know, came and spoke and wrote for us. And we did a lot of stuff with the Conservatives as well. And with Labour, it wasn't, it, you know, we did a lot of work across the board. But at that point, I was sort of out as a Liberal and as a Liberal Democrat and and writing that we should, you know, if you're a liberal, vote liberal. Uh, and then, um, you know, obviously the coalition formed and Nick asked me to to join him in government. So I did about the first half of the coalition government um, with him doing, you know, doing some speech writing and policy. So uh, all kinds of questions I could ask you about that. Obviously, it didn't work out that well for the Liberal Democrats being in coalition in David Cameron's conservative government, uh, at least electorally. But I wonder how you feel about radical centrism generally. Is it still something you look to uh, in terms yeah, of... Yeah, you asked, you asked how I define myself. I like that label. Uh, I mean, I like, like that, you know, I like vital center too. I think that um, what we're trying to get at with both those phrases is to get past the idea that the center is boring, that it's moderate, that it's split mm -hmm. the difference um, politics. Um, and instead, I think to kind of found it around, you know, I like liberalism because I, I do think that having this commitment to the flourishing of individuals and finding way in a very John Stuart Mill sense, finding cultures, societies and structures that allow them to do that is still the very best bet for building good societies. And it's, you know, I find the sort of post liberal arguments that are going on uh, right now to be entirely unconvincing. And uh, I, I, there's, you know, there are some interesting points being made by the post liberals, but um, but it just runs into the sand. Liberalism is absolutely the right way to think about uh, you know, politics, in my view. And so in that sense, I, but but it does sound soggy if you're not careful about it. And what I liked <laughs> about Nick, and, and I think it's true, is he was actually a liberal. I mean, to his to his fingertips, he was an actual liberal. Uh, he recognized that liberal societies are messy and raucous and... You know, there's it, it's a, it's a it's a job of work to build a liberal society. It's not something that runs itself like a little machine that you can set to run. You know, you've got to you got to roll your sleeves up. You got to you, you got to work. And Nick, you know, Nick in that sense, I think was it became clear to me as I got to know him that like, okay, this guy really means it. And that wasn't true of all the Liberal Democrats. I mean, there were quite a lot of, mm. quite a lot of Social Democrats in the Liberal Democrats from the SDB days. And, so that was a, that's a political philosophy and in fact a moral philosophy that I really I think I post I discovered latterly was really what had been driving me all along. You know, despite having wrestled with the terms moderation and centrism for decades now, it's not entirely clear to me what they mean. Uh, I think everyone agrees that a moderation that simply tries to split the differences between left and right is probably worse than useless. Um, but your book strikes me as an example of a kind of approach, which maybe we can call moderate or centrist, which seek solutions to societal problems by looking in the spaces between the entrenched ideological positions of left and right. And in the case of, of boys and men, progressives refuse to accept that gender inequalities can run in both directions. And to the extent that they accept that there are distinctive 
problems for boys and men. They write them off as the consequences of toxic masculinity. Uh, conservatives often are more sensitive to the struggles of boys and men, but their solution, as you pointed out, is to try to restore a, a patriarchal society complete with traditional gender roles. Um, and what I like about your approach is, is, as you write, what is needed is a positive vision of masculinity that is compatible with gender equality. So really trying to avoid the problems of both left and right while finding actual solutions. Yeah, and I'm uh, acutely aware that there's a danger here of, of both sidesism and and also there's a kind of intellectual vanity that that can be that uh, that can trip you up as like, look, you know, left are getting this, right are getting this. Here's here's me kind of coming through, like the the superior to all of them, and and there is a sort of certain um, satisfaction to that framing, and so I'm I'm aware of the the dangers here, but. I do try to give credit where it's due as well to to both sides. I mean, I think that you know there's a lot of conservative thinkers, for example, who were warning that actually one of the consequences of gender equal, of greater gender equality and economic power for women would may well be to dislocate men. Right? They were really worried about that. Um, you even cite George Gilder, who was saying that George in Gilder. the early seventies. Yeah. yeah, I do, and. And every time you you do that, of course, if you're looking over your left shoulder, you're like, uh -oh, I'm going to get attacked for this. And then, you know, uh, and then you look, but, but you have to sort of write without kind of worrying about that. And yeah, I think they were right. They were right to worry. I don't think things turned out any, you know, they thought there'd be marauding bands of like unmarried men going around. And of course, crime rates have dropped very significantly rather than that. But, but I think they were right to worry about the dislocation. What they were wrong to do is say, that's why we should stop feminism, right? As a liberation movement, it was just unstoppable and moral, had all the force of morality behind it. They weren't wrong about that. And the, you know, and the left aren't wrong to say that, look, there aren't still huge issues facing kind of girls and women, and we absolutely need to continue to focus on them. And there are many circumstances where women are, uh, are in a power relationship with men that is that inhibits their autonomy. But they're also both wrong about a lot of this stuff. And <laughs> most importantly, just like track, it's almost like, I don't know if I use this analogy in the book, but it's like, I think I do, it's like trench warfare. It's just like, like if we give these people an inch, they'll take the whole lot. They'll overrun the entire system. It is like World War One style warfare, where it's just everyone's dug in and terrified of losing even a tiny bit of ground. If we give an inch, they'll take a mile. And I do think in the case of sex and gender, it's true. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a, I didn't set out to say, I'm going to steer a path through the middle, right? Whatever the left's saying, whatever the right's saying, I'm going to come between them. It was more just this growing frustration with both sides of this missed opportunity. And so I don't, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, uh, I didn't sort of set my GPS <laughs> by say, taking the two and say, go between those two positions. And honestly, I think that if, if I thought that one side or the other was doing better on this issue, I, I like to think I would have said so. I just genuinely don't think they are. Uh, I want to briefly allude here to your 2017 book, Dream Hoarders, How the American Upper Middle Class is Leaving Everyone Else in the Dust, Why That is a Problem and What to Do About It. This book was a big influence really on everybody here at the Niskanen Center, uh, not least for the ways in which my colleagues Brink Lindsay and Steve Tellis grappled with similar issues in their book on the captured economy. Um, and in cartoonishly brief terms, uh, that book looks at the way that the upper middle class, which you define as the top 20% of earners, has pulled away from the middle class and the poor on five dimensions, income and wealth, educational attainment, family structure, geography, and health and longevity. What's the connection between dream hoarders and of boys and men? It's the intersection between those pulling apart of class boundaries that you just described there. Very good job, by the way. I mean, that's a pretty good pemmican of <laughs> dream hoarders. I should capture that myself when I forget what it was about. <laughs> um, it is that it's this need to look at gender through a class lens and vice versa, because at the top in those upper middle class uh, households, actually men are basically doing pretty well. I mean, their wages are higher than men in the same position. They are tending to share households with women who are doing unbelievably well mm -hmm. by comparison. But, but it scrambles the idea of this simple gender binary, right? So it is the case now that 40% of women earn more than the median man. 
In, 79, that, in 1979, it was only 13% of women earned more than the median man. It just You have to pause on that for a moment. You're like, okay. And what that means is the distributions are just overlapping much more tightly now. Now, it's not 50%, right? When you get to 50% of women, <laughs> then we'll have got to absolute gender equality in the labor market. So we're not there yet. And there's all kinds of reasons for that we could get into largely about family. But wow, that's a different world. And the class gap, while the gender gap pay gap has narrowed, the class gap has widened and the race gap has remained very stubborn. And so women at the top of the distribution are earning way more than men in the middle of the the bottom. And white women are earning much more than black men. They didn't used to, but they overtook them in the 90s. And so I think those are the sorts of things we really have to be looking at as we're talking about this. And I really worry that this is a connective tissue between the two books that you're helping me draw out is that for upper middle class folks, you look around and you very often say, well, what's the problem here? That's true of all kinds of things, right? Whether it it comes to health issues, obesity, uh, uh, you know, marriage rates. And and in this case, men, you look, I don't really see the problem here, but but when it comes to gender, the problem is that we might be leaning in, to use Sheryl Sandberg's famous phrase, but not looking down. And life is very different indeed for men further down the ladder, especially black men, um, but also white working class men and working class men of all races. And the combination of narrowing gender gaps on average across the board and widening class gaps means that it's very important to widen the lens here and look at the prospects, not just of the men at the top who still dominate boardrooms and congress and so on but the men lower down yeah as you put it facing left there is simply no way to reduce economic inequality without improving the fortunes of less advantaged boys and men that's my view yeah you know there's another divide here although you don't often explicitly allude to it which seems to be a sort of generational divide i hope you don't spend as much time as i do looking at memes online but you're probably (laughs) familiar with you know a sort of genre which is Young people saying, you know, when my parents were my age, in their late 20s or early 30s, they had a home, a car, they were already started on a family. Here I am on the couch in my parents' basement uh, playing video games with only a bag of Doritos to my name. And I suppose that is a question. What happened to make, uh, apparently, the chances for young people, particularly young men, so different 50 years ago versus today? Well, it's a... it's true to say that the the old scripts that both men and women used to have um, were simultaneously constraining, uh, but also simplifying, like all scripts, right? <laughs> the thing about a script is it's pretty easy to follow. And so for men in particular, the, the script of get educated, maybe get a bit more educated, why? So that you can go and earn more, why? Because you're going to have to take care of a family, um, and your prospects of earning more are going to be important to forming a family and who you form a family with. And so I'm not suggesting it was, ex- it was explicit, but it was just that was just what you did is what my dad did. It's just like that's it was it was kind of laid out for you. And similarly for women, you know, so my dad went off to university to earn more so he could do more. My mum was told be a nurse or a, or a teacher and left school at 17 because that will allow you to raise your kids. Right. So these are no one questioned it. And so the tearing up of those scripts by the women's movement, which has been a profoundly liberating change, has also been a disorienting one. And I think it's been particularly disorienting for men because there is a new script for women, which is become economically independent, make sure you can stand on your own two feet, get become powerful so that you can, you know, have to rely on a man. That was one of the main purposes of the women's movement. And it's been achieved with spectacular success, even if not complete. It's wow, wow, are things different 40 years ago. What about men? What's the new script for men in this world where women don't need them? And we haven't really invented one yet. And so without a script, I do think there's a danger of dislocation, disorientation, and drift. And that's what I think you're seeing in a lot of young men. It's like, where, where's the moment? You know, why? Like, why should I do X? And we don't have a great answer for that for a lot of young men now. And I think that's why this is quite a deep cultural problem. Uh, as much as it is an economic or a social or political one. I think that we've really radically transformed the economic relationship between men and women in the blink of an eye. Uh, and we haven't we haven't helped men to adjust to this new world. Uh, and the result is that many of them are left reeling or on the couch, and on the, to use the stereotypes you just used, but there's some truth to them on, on the couch, on the sofa. But 
it's not clear to, to many of them why they shouldn't do that. What's what's the what's the script what I'm supposed to be reading from now? They don't know. Yeah, you know, one of the ways to think about, or that I think about, the connection between dream hoarders and uh, of boys and men is that dream hoarders is largely about some of the consequences of the United States moving toward a meritocratic society uh, and many of the negative consequences of that happening. And, you know, part of the reason that I got into history was just that it's fun to think about the strangeness of the past, how much it is a foreign country. And the key figure in my first book was Kingman Brewster, who was really the person who brought meritocracy to Yale University in the 1960s. Oh, and yes. as part of that, he also was the person who co-educated a college that had been all male since its founding in 1701. And the way in which co-education was talked about back then really boggles the mind. Uh, it was thought then that young women, by going to college, particularly an expensive college like one of the Ivies, would incur what was called a negative dowry. That is to say, mm -hmm. they come out with college debt, and what man in his right mind would want to take on that negative dowry by marrying this woman? So actually giving them a kind of education at a place like Harvard or Yale would be a negative for their life's chances, particularly of getting married. Um, no one at that time thought that actually this would allow that particularly incoming generation of young women in the late 60s and early 70s, a huge leg up in the professions, and that uh, increasingly there would be an earnings premium attached to precisely the kind of jobs that rewarded people who came from that sort of education. Um, so I think meritocracy is definitely part of what has, has sidelined men because, as you say, they aren't as, as interested in education, they mature more slowly in school, and also because the nature of men's work has been so radically changed mm. by forces like uh, automation and, and globalization. Interesting. I mean, I think the, the way you're framing it is the, the kinds of, so first of all, meritocracy has been good in the sense that it's just allowed you know, the people who are the best for the job or best in class to rise, but it's also exposed structural disadvantages for some groups, but also you know, the kind of, who you know, as Amartya Sen famously said, the thing about mm. merit is you always got to watch for who's defining what's meritorious. And mm. it's typically the winners that define merit. But I think it's possible to claim that some of the things we see as meritorious now are at least as likely to be found in women and then the women's skills and education as they are in men. And so that could be part of the sidelining and men are struggling to catch up. But I think your point about college is super interesting. I think it's one of the reasons probably, I mean, women didn't go to college very much at all, of course, right? It was like 10% or something in the, in the late 60s. But another fact that kind of blew my mind was that up until nine, the early 1970s, you know, and I was born in 69, I'm in my early 50s. And so it's like, this is within my lifetime. Uh, until that point, uh, the typical woman who did go to college and get a four-year degree was married within a year of graduating. Mm. And of course, we know what marriage meant kind of those times, but married within a year of graduating. Whereas right. now, most kind of, if you've got a four-year college degree, it's like into your early 30s, like late 20s, early 30s. It's just like a, a, one of those little signs of just how far the world has changed. <laughs> it's like even the women who went to college, and there's a small number, were married within a year of graduating which is a kind of, I think, a sign of both these kind of cultural and, and social changes that, that uh, kind of underlie a lot of what's going on here. And I think that what you're pointing to is this sense that there's all these facts and figures and my book is, you know, I'm trying to make it as authoritative as possible, but, but very often what's happening is there are these subcurrents, there are these cultural subcurrents which connect these different data points, but are really, are really kind of beneath them. And so this question of motivation that you were referring to earlier, of agency, of oomph, of like whatever it's like you go girl or you go, whatever it <laughs> that kind of just the that sense of propulsion the that you can't really measure but you can see outcomes from it and so again i was really struck by the fact that women are now twice as likely to study abroad that's conditional on being in college in the first but for every subject twice as likely to volunteer for america or peace corps and tell you, well, why is that? There's no obvious reason why. And also it's ignored generally. So that's terribly intriguing to me. Um, and that's a change. It's really shifted, just the ratios. And I think it is this just this sense of propulsion, right? So to extend the metaphor probably too far, it's like a lot of these young women have got two massive engines on the back of their boat and they're going, <laughs> they're going, right? And the guys are just sort of like tinkering with the engine and like battling along by comparison. It's like they're or they're in a sailboat, right? Why is she going so much faster? And she's got two massive Yamaha engines on the back.
<laughs> you know, something else interesting about uh, your analysis is that you point out that this is an international phenomenon to some extent as well. Um, the 58% of, of college students in, in the UK are now women. And I think the stat, you, one of the stats you also mentioned is that internationally, boys are 50% more likely than girls to fail at all key, three key school subjects, math, reading, and science. Um, yes. Uh, so this is something that we're seeing not just uh, here in the United States, but in, in many developed societies as well. That's right, especially the education point. But actually, a lot of these trends, labor force participation and obviously economic inequality too. But, but the education one is just it's so consistent in advanced economies, especially. I think it's important to make that distinction that it's really hard not to think there's something structural there. Right? And there isn't something about the way that the education systems are, are you know, operating that isn't putting boys and uh, men at a slight disadvantage. It's just like when it's every country in the OECD has more young people with more young women with tertiary education than young men. And that was the opposite just you know, a few decades ago. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why I think we have to look to structural explanations, because when it's happening everywhere, it's not, it's not the it's not something wrong with the you know, what's happening it's not the US K12 education system <laughs> there's something deeper and I, and as i you know as i uh, alluded to earlier i think that one of the main problems um, is this treatment of girls and boys at the age of 15 as if they're actually the same developmentally speaking when they're not the, the boys are a long way behind on average but also this kind of motivation what are the, the incentives I think that girls and women feel very strong incentives to get highly educated so that they can be economically independent. I think that's a very powerful message to them. And you just don't quite quite the same incentive structure uh, for boys and men. Arguably, their incentives have, uh, have softened because, in the old age, right, as I said, like my dad went to college so that he could get a better job so he could raise his family more, you know, better. But now, is that... I'm not sure that's as I'm sure that many young men feel that uh, motivation anymore, and so the the motivations around education have perhaps actually reversed between men and women. Possibly, uh, although you know another one of the stats that stood out after, uh, to me was that in 2020, the Law Review, at every one of the top 16 law schools in this country, had a woman as editor in chief, and it is definitely uh, still you know uh, a matter of importance, shall we say, to get that kind of position for the sake of your future career. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's also been these studies of like high school valedictorians being like at least three, like 70, I could never actually, I couldn't nail this fact down enough to put it in the book, but like 75% of high school valedictorians. Um, I think the editor of every newspaper at the Ivy Leagues was a woman in that same year or year, the following year. And it's a bit what you're talking about, uh, Jeffrey, about your own experience too, is that it's, it's not just this kind of general trend for girls and women to be doing much better than uh, boys and men in education, but really these t top honors. It's really these kind of you know the, where that where are these laurels going to right right at the top here and uh, and the, there I think the gender skew just gets even stronger, uh, even more than anything else. And there's another is another example which speaks a bit more to this kind of weird sort of motivational thing. It was like the New York Times does this uh, competition every year. It's a high school essay writing competition. And the winners get to get published and you know whatever. And I went through the 10 and it's like, I don't know, it was almost all girls. And so I emailed them and I just said, look, are you tracking the gender of the of the applicants? And they said, yeah, it's like probably three quarters girls. Um, yeah, uh, They went and looked for it for me. And again, you're like, what's going on there? Like, what is it? And I think, again, it's this purpose, this agency, this ambition, this aspiration, whatever we're talking about. There's an aspiration gap here too. I have this, this line in the book where I said that for a long time, women have had to, be fighting misogyny from without, but now men are fighting and struggling for motivation from within. And I do think that this, this motivation point is important, but we have to look at the structures and systems and norms and signals that, that cause us to be motivated. This doesn't come out of thin air, right? It's like, well, why should I be motivated? Why should I uh, get better educated? And we don't, as I said, the, the danger is we, we have a great answer for that for women now, but we don't have such a great answer for men. My sister is an advanced nurse practitioner uh, dealing with psychiatry and psychology in Tennessee. And she sees a lot of men from these, you know, this very red state, uh, these very left behind areas. And a lot of what she says is, you know, these men are just missing the things their parents had in terms of work, family, and, and religion to some extent. Mm. Um, and I was reminded of that when uh, you quoted one author 
writing on the phenomenon of the male suicide, saying that men are afflicted by a gnawing sense of purposelessness. And you wrote that the true cause of male malaise, I believe, is not lack of labor force participation, but cultural redundancy. And I, I thought that was very telling. Yeah. And the, of course, those things all get wrapped up together. Uh, is this sense of men being benched uh, or benching themselves in many cases. And I think that's partly because if they if they fail to fulfill the, the traditional role of breadwinner and we haven't updated what they're put their, haven't updated their role, then there's a sense of like, well, I'm then I'm I'm, I'm benched. But yeah, I actually cite the work of Catherine Eden, uh, who's now at Princeton, and she she led a, a research team that led to a paper called the Haphazard Self, hmm. which really looked at men in working class communities, and it was precisely the point that you, your sister was making, which is that these you know men used to have these anchors, uh, institutional anchors for identity and purpose, and and they were the ones that you've just identified, and. And absent those, their point is that these people are trying to construct a self, but they're doing it haphazardly. They're improvising. This is the language that Catherine Eden does. Well, their sense of improv and improvising is really hard. Improvising a self is hard. And I say this as a million liberal, right? <laughs> Which is like this. Mill absolutely understood that you need help to do that, and that there are institutions and cultures that help you to do that. Right? There are norms and institutions. It's just that those institutions can be revised and individuals can sometimes depart from them, which isn't this sandblasted landscape that the post-liberals claim. And men in particular uh, have lost some of those anchors more strongly than women have because fatherhood doesn't have the same anchoring role as motherhood. Yeah. I think this might have been a, a depressing book, if not for the fact that you work in a think tank and therefore you have solutions. Um, so I'd like to go through some of them. Um, one of the ideas you put forward is the subject of an article that you just put out in The Atlantic a few days ago called Red Shirt the Boys. This is the term from uh, the athletic world where a student is redshirted by staying behind a grade so that they can be bigger when it comes to actually entering the football game, whatever it is. But your idea is basically to introduce a one-year chronological age gap for boys by keeping them back a year. Is, is that more or less accurate the way, the way that I've described it? It is, yeah. And I think the, the broad point you make, and I appreciate uh, you saying this is that I do I do lean pretty heavily on solutions in the book, and that was that was something I really forced myself to do. There, I, I'm pretty sure it's Yasha Monk who talks about the chapter eleven problem, which is <laughs> there's all these books, right, that you have ten chapters just outlying in exquisite detail just how how screwed we all are, and then the publisher or someone says, well, you've got to have some solutions, and so chapter eleven says, oh, well, let's have pre K and I don't know something else, more college, free college. And you can tell it's sort of tacked on and sometimes you wish it wasn't there. But I just felt like probably partly because of what I do for a living, but also I wanted to move the debate onto an argument about solutions rather than just about problems. And so, yeah, one of them is this idea that that uh, boys should start school a year later than girls. And the reason for that is that because especially in adolescence, there is quite a, str a big developmental gap on average between uh, girls and boys. Um, and that particularly comes in the form of development of the prefrontal cortex, which is the bit that helps you get stuff done. The CEO of the brain is how it's sometimes referred to. And so it's like planfulness, self-organization, -organ you know, ability to defer gratification, look to the future, etc. All the stuff that helps you get a good high school GPA, fill out a college essay, etc. You know, I had one of my kids refused on principle to apply anywhere that required a college essay because that would be more work, right? And so, but that wasn't true of his female classmates who were churning out college essays every night. But that kind of planfulness you get, and it does, it, it, you know, the boys do catch up, but much but later, and the biggest gap seems to be at about 15, 16, which is a critical period in, in education. Um, and particularly skills that are rewarded in the current education system. So by by having the boys be a year older than girls, what it would mean chronologically, what it would mean is that they were developmentally a little bit closer. Uh, yeah. So in that sense, I think it would be more equitable. It would level the playing field somewhat. You point out that the upper middle class, because they read authors like Malcolm Gladwell, who's written yeah. about this in Outliers, and uh, the already do practice this. Yeah, yeah. And the <laughs> I'm getting lots of emails now from people saying, oh, this is great. I'm going to do this, which is what a lot of my colleagues are worried about, which is you're just going to raise the issue again, which is going to make lots of upper middle class people do it. And their boys benefit the least compared to lower income boys 
from that extra year. And and so that is a real danger with this kind of work. But it is, it's really, as a matter of public policy, I think important that more lower income parents have the opportunity to do this um, so that the, the boys are on something more of a level playing field because otherwise the boys are kind of behind all the way. And there is this, there are all kinds of challenges to it. And I'm getting lots of very interesting feedback on the proposal. And obviously I did a lot of work with a lot of the authors coming into it. But but one of the things I've kind of wondered is that everyone's assumed that the way, only way to do this is for boys to go a year later than currently. But of course, another way to do it is for girls to go a year earlier because they are just that much more ready, maybe. And that would that would mean that the boys would go as they currently do, but they wouldn't be in classrooms where they're being outcompeted all the time by the girls. And the US you know, does have a relatively late starting age. I haven't really fully thought this through yet, but I very clearly don't say, look, what those ages should be. It's just that it's very clear that at, that at 15, 16, especially, if you've got a classroom of 50, 50 boys and girls, everything else equal, the girls are going to be ahead just because their brains have developed much more quickly. And one of the reasons for that is they hit puberty quite a bit earlier. And interestingly, there's some evidence that that um, that uh, COVID seems to be pulling forward puberty a little bit more for girls as well. There's been some research on that earlier. And so that could, again, we don't know how that'll play out, but there is just this fact that, you know, girls become young women earlier than boys become young men. And to the extent the education system rewards the skills that typically come with young womanhood or young manhood, then it's no surprise the girls are doing so much better. The miracle is that they weren't. That is is really the that it's big, not bigger. That the gap isn't bigger than it already is. The question then is that why didn't we see it before? And the answer mm-hmm. is because of sexism. Yeah. Right. Girls didn't go to college before, so we couldn't see how much better they were. But by what we've done is we've leveled the playing field in school, and what that's done is it's made it clear that some of the players are better than others, uh, and they're better because they develop earlier. You point out in passing that boys would benefit from more physical education in school, a later school start time, better food. But you Mm. put more emphasis on a proposal to get more men teaching boys, and particularly in the early years, particularly black men, and particularly teaching English. Tell me more about that. Yeah, it's again, it's, it's, it's one of these things where it's quite hard to see exactly what the kind of causal arrows here are. But it does seem like, you know, when the boys benefit from having male teachers, especially in uh, especially in subjects like English. The the evidence seems to suggest that girls benefit from having female teachers in subjects that are not traditionally seen as female, like science STEM subjects. But the boys seem to do better when they have men teaching subjects that boys struggle in, like English, um, without affecting the performance of, of girls. And so the general picture is that K-12 education in, in the US, and this is true in the UK too, and some other countries, is becoming progressively more female. It's an occupation where far from getting gender desegregated, it's becoming more and more segregated. The same is true, by the way, of psychology, counseling, social work, many other um, professions. But it's 76% of K-12 teachers are women now. In elementary schools, it's over 90%. And lots of elementary schools with no male teachers at all. And this is just happening. And it's not really getting any attention, not really seen as a problem even though there is evidence, as I suggest, that male teachers are, are particularly good for, for boys. And there's evidence that if, particularly around race, if you intersect with race too, that, that black boys seem to benefit in particular from having black male teachers. There's quite a lot of a push now for more diver- racial diversity in the teaching profession, and I welcome that. But there's almost nothing being said about gender diversity and almost nothing being said about this. And my fear is that we'll just keep going, keep going, and one day it'll be 85% female and maybe someone will say hell hold on maybe this is maybe this isn't great maybe we need more men but by that point it's become so gendered as an occupation that you're really going against the grain to try and persuade boys and men to go into it and so we're approaching a dangerous tipping point i think where teaching is seen as a feminine profession and one consequence of that could be that boys come to see educational success as female and that actually the, the, you know, to remember Akerlof and Cranton stuff on identity economics is that I really worry that educational success might start to be seen as a bit girly, a bit feminine. It already is to some extent, but but that could get really locked in. And then you've got a very dangerous, vicious cycle, I think. Yeah. And, you know, social conservatives like Moda Charon have also worried uh, about what's going to happen to these women who are at lopsided gender ratio colleges when they want to get married. And they tend to want to get married to men who have as much or more education than they do and who earn more than they do. And they're going to find a much smaller pool of available mates in that sense. Yep. They're going to have to adjust their expectations. And I think they, I think they will, by the way. I think they will. 
I've spoken with um, people like Oren Cass about the need to invest in more vocational, educational, and training, although he didn't really approach it from the same male-friendly point of view that you did. But I'm particularly interested in your coining of this term HEAL jobs. That's H-E-A-L, and that's an acronym for Health, Education, Administration, and Literacy. How would you uh, get more men into such jobs? And why should we? Well, there's a couple of things there. I mean, one is that I, you know, I actually strongly agree with Oren on a lot of his work around vocational uh, training, including in these healed professions, which I'll come to. But I think, I think there's an important, more general point here, which is that one of, I think one of the reasons why there's a bit of a reluctance to invest in some of these vocational uh, approaches is precisely because they are so skewed towards men. And the evidence is that they help boys and men. So if you look at the analyses, for example, of technical high schools, which I write about, you know, I call for a thousand new technical high schools, mm-hmm. actually there's really good evidence that they help boys. No evidence they help girls. They don't mm-hmm. hurt girls, but they don't help them at all. And so, and the same with apprenticeships. Like appren- 93% of apprentices right now are men. And I think that's one of the reasons why the National Apprenticeship uh, Bill is stuck in a Senate committee and has been for a year. It's just because there's this kind of worry that it's... But I see that now as a feature rather than a bug, Hmm. given what's happening to boys and men in education. And so the fact that vocational education seems to help boys and men more should, I now think, as as a good thing, given what's happening on the other side of the equation around... uh, around academic education. And then one of the things that I think would be particularly helpful is, is to use more vocational opportunities to get men into these healed professions. So health, education, administration, and literacy, which is like the, the opposite of STEM, basically. And so the same effort we put into getting more women in STEM, I want to see us getting more men into heal. And that's for a few reasons. One, because those are really growing professions, uh, growing areas. And so there is the kind of there are jobs there, right? So my calculations are that for every one STEM job we're going to create between now and 2030, we're going to create three in Heal. Uh, secondly, a lot of those areas do have some quite serious potential labor shortages. Now, this, the shortage of teachers is actually a complex story, but we are going to need more nurses and we are going to need teachers. And we shouldn't try and solve those labor shortages with only half the workforce. And then thirdly, and in some ways, I think I would now start with this if I was doing it again, which is that I think it's, suboptimal if the use if you've got if the users of services are 50 50 female male or maybe even more male than female if the vast majority of providers are female and so clinical psychology is an example where it's gone from 39 percent male to 29 percent male in the last 10 years alone and if you look at psychologists under the age of 30 only five percent of them are male so psychology is just galloping towards being a kind of basically a female profession and i think there are some men who I actually would prefer to speak to a male psychologist sometimes. I did when I was in therapy. And so, uh, and it's not crazy that boys might want a male school counselor sometimes. And, and so, and in, even in the care profession, right, when you're needing really intimate care in a social care environment or a nursing environment. And so there are all kinds of reasons why it's good for the men, it's good for the professions, and it's good for the users of those services. So we should throw some money at that problem. Where are the male scholarships? Uh, scholarships for men going into nursing and teaching? Where are the subsidies for employers hiring men in those professions? The answer is there are none of them, but there are all kinds of the equivalents for women into STEM. I think that socially it's just as important now and we should invest appropriately. So specifically, you call for a billion dollar national investment in the twin goals of seeking 30% female uh, participation in STEM and 30% male participation in heel jobs by 2030. Yeah, we're nearly there for women in STEM. It's 27% STEM jobs now by women. And women are now, women now account for the majority of scientists in the US. Um, they are ahead in a lot of the STEM subjects in college. So really great progress. Uh, still much more to do in terms of women in STEM. Meanwhile, there are fewer men in HEAL. The percentage of men in HEAL jobs is dropping. And so when you see one trend line going one way, you want to keep it going, of course, but another trend line going the other way, I'm not sure that ignoring it completely for the reasons we've just discussed is the socially responsible thing to do. And among the other policy solutions that you put forward, uh, one is paid leave for fathers as well as mothers. Uh, Six months, 100% of income on a use it or lose it basis. (laughs) Mm. Uh, More uh, uh, more of a tendency towards shared custody uh, arrangements. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. um, Child support payments being more calibrated, I guess, to the father's ability to pay and more flexible job arrangements uh, as well. Yeah, I think the um, that's a great summary. Thank you for that. Uh, I mean, I th- let's, let me just step back a little bit and say, what, what are we trying to do here? Um, because I think that's important context. What I'm trying to do with these policies and more generally is to 
try and rebuild fatherhood as an independent social institution. And this is where a lot of social conservatives very strongly depart from what I'm arguing here, because my view is that the old view that marriage was the way to bind men to children indirectly, right? So it used to be like women were economically dependent on men. Men were dependent on women to raise the kids. The women had the direct relationship with the kids and the dads had an indirect relationship with their kids. So if you think of like an org chart, it's like a dotted line basically from the dad to the kid, right? And then direct lines from father to mother and mother down to the kids. Um, and that world is not coming back even if we wanted it to, which I don't. And so we have to recognize the fact that marriage is not the vehicle anymore through which we essentially help continue to bond men and fathers to children. So what that means is it needs to be fatherhood itself. And so one of the reasons why I have this rather radical proposal for paid leave, and I think it is radical back to where we started this conversation, Jeffrey, right? And it's radical for all kinds of, one, how long it is, how generous it is, but actually... In some ways, the most culturally radical thing about it is its equality, is that it's independently available. So if dad doesn't take it, it's not like mum, it doesn't transfer to mum, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what that does is it basically, uh, it sends a very powerful signal and practice that dads matter as much as mums. Uh, and I think that's not a message that's really being heard right now. And so if the message is dads matter as much as mums because they're a breadwinner, well, as soon as they fail to be a good enough breadwinner, they're benched, right? Um, if dads matter as helpers to mum, well, if they're separated from the mum, maybe they're never even with them. They're benched. And when 40% of kids are born outside marriage, born outside marriage, that's even before we get to divorce, trying to sort of reimagine the sort of marriage contract that was a pretty stable, if deeply unfair way to organize family life for a very long time is a fool's errand. But that doesn't mean we should just bench the fathers as a result. Fathers still matter, and I have some evidence for how they matter. Uh, and that's the argument for giving them exactly the same rights to leave as mothers. Again, pretty controversial on the left and the right. The right don't like the idea that I'm saying we have to separate, we have to free fatherhood from marriage is basically what I'm saying. Of course, the right don't like that because they still think, I think, I think naively that they can rebuild this marriage based on economic dependency. But the left don't like it because they're like, wait, you're going to give it to the dads? Why can't you give, to, why, why aren't you giving 12 months to the moms? Especially if you're just a single mom, right? And so it's a zero, they see it as a zero-sum game, to which my answer is, well, unless you get more fathers involved, that's bad for mothers and women too. But it's, again, I think it's one of these debates that it's, it's proving quite hard to have right now. And anything like this smacks of, quotes father's rights, which is, of course, automatically seen as a bad thing. Uh, and so it, this stuff can be a little bit difficult to kind of persuade people of. But I think the egalitarian case for it is pretty strong. Yeah, I love these proposals, but I worry about the political context into which they are going. Mm. You cited... Josh Hawley's speech at the National Conservatism Conference uh, last year, uh, where he made you know a, a lot of hay about claiming that the left hates men and that's why they're mm. doing badly, and yet he doesn't really have any proposals. Um, on the other hand, you know another one of the actually fairly depressing aspects of your book is that policy solutions often don't work for men while they work for women, or, or vice versa in in some cases, and I think this stems from what you identify as the, the failing of the left on issues relating to boys and men, which is just an unwillingness to acknowledge any biological basis for sex differences, as well as what you call the fixed conviction that gender equality can only run one way, that is to the disadvantage of women. So to what extent are you optimistic that there could be some movement on both the positions of left and right to achieve some of these solutions? If I'm being candid, I, I'm uh, at a political level, I'm pessimistic in the short run. Um, but at a cultural level, much more optimistic than I was when I started writing the book. So at a political level, I think for now, anyway, both sides are going to dig in. Um, you know, I think the Democrats are going to you know, dig in as the sort of women's party to, to label it. And many of the policies they're pursuing um, point in that direction. Even something like kind of college, uh, you know, college loan forgiveness is, of course, a hugely pro-female policy overall um, and various others because they want to they want to turn out suburban women, especially white women uh, in the midterms. Um, and I think the right will continue to play into this sense of the left are after are after masculinity, men, family, religion, etc. Uh, and stoke fear. Uh, in the way that Hawley did in that in that speech, because I think that'll get their base base out. So I think to the extent that both sides are playing to their bases right now, that doesn't make me hopeful at all. 
culturally, I'm more optimistic because as I've talked to people about this, including you know very very socially conservative folks, but also diehard liberal feminists, they're like, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> uh, I'm, and even if they don't agree with all my proposals, like yeah, yeah, there is something here. And it's almost like people need a permission space to talk about this stuff. And one of my goals, this is now a sort of editorial goal, a rhetorical goal for the book as opposed to substantive one, was to try and create a permission space to have this conversation, particularly for people who are sort of in the center, right? Who, who are, like, if you, you could be afraid if you're in the center that even talking about this stuff means, oh, you, you, so you agree with Josh Hawley then? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> right? uh, that's not what I mean. So, no, no, it's fine. Look, and so that's the goal, partly, is to correct. And I've been pleasantly surprised by the reception from from many folks uh, in the center and a sense of yes this is a conversation we need to be having but we need to be having it sensibly respectfully try and do authoritatively try and do it in a solutions oriented way um, and try and look for solutions and you're right that i wanted i have a whole chapter on which is actually a uh, an essay in national affairs as well on how so many policy policy interventions, especially in education and training, really seem to have better effects for women and girls. But that's great. It means they worked for some. But it didn't really work so well for the boys and men. So what should we be doing instead for the boys and men? And we've talked about a lot of those things already around vocational training, maybe red shirting, et cetera. And that's fine. It's fine to say, look, some things seem to be working for some groups and not others. Let's be a little bit more targeted, perhaps, in some of these policies but it requires you to recognize that there are gender differences in the first place and one of the things i'm being accused of is gender essentialism that's the sort of thing you get accused of by even suggesting that there might be any differences inherent differences between boys and girls or men and women that might explain some of these patterns um which in my view they do to a certain extent and again it's another it's another false false binary did you by any chance see alex lee moyer's 2020 documentary tfw no gf no, someone else has mentioned that to me though. It's about incel and frog Twitter subcultures, um, yeah, and yeah. one is always a bit suspicious of documentaries. They're they're highly yeah. constructed rather than being direct representation. Well, the manosphere is a, the manosphere is a dangerous place, but I think that one of the one of the arguments that I make is that uh, if responsible people don't address problems, irresponsible people will exploit them. And I think that that's really happening and that this kind of some of the things we're most worried about. I've seen it in my own kids. You know, I now I now sort of think that I now think a Ben Shapiro phase is kind of like a rite of passage for American mm-hmm. adults and boys yeah. now is that they kind of almost have to go through a phase because they just need to hear someone saying some of this stuff. And then they go, yeah, actually, maybe not. Right? They grow out of it. Right. So so when, when you know, when my kids were at Ben Shapiro or somebody, I say it's just a phase. It's just a phase. And sure enough, it was. Um, but if. If there's nothing, this is where the Hawley's attack was so, was so I think, sounded so good to a lot of people. Was good. When he says the left think men are the problem, they think toxic masculinity. and It sounds true to a lot of people because the left do say some of that. But more importantly, there isn't much there that they say that's positive about boys and men. And mm-hmm. I think that the renaming of the Women and Girls Council as the Gender Equality Council in the Biden White House was a huge opportunity huge opportunity to say, guess what? We're about gender equality now. And there are some that go the other way. And we're going to talk about those as well. Absolutely didn't do that. It's completely asymmetric. And I just feel like that wouldn't be too hard. I just feel like if you just pointed out like some of the things we've talked about here around suicide rates, deaths of despair, some of the educational problems that boys are having, especially black boys. Why? We talked about my red shirting proposal, but one in four black boys are held back a grade by the time they finish high school, right? And so why just a few of those put out there, I think it would completely blunt the attack from the right that the left don't care about boys and men. Um, and it would also be true uh, that these that these are real problems that they could then address. And I, I fear that's an opportunity that's being missed on the left to do that. And I think there's an opportunity to be missed on the right, which is to say, look, we've been saying this for a long time. We've been warning this is kind of issue for boys and men. So how can we how can we engage in a conversation around this which is completely compatible with gender equality? Right? Women are getting more and more equal by the day. That is a good thing, and it's not going to change. And so so wishful thinking about a world of economic dependence of women on men is not going to help men today because 
they're the ones whose wives are the breadwinners and they're trying to raise their kids they're trying to make it work and so i think there's a missed opportunity on both sides here to have a really productive conversation about these problems if only we can get past the trench warfare that they're currently engaged in and there's real common ground for solutions that would make a big difference to our national happiness you'd think so i mean some of these things about like and, and when i put these ideas out there it's interesting it's, it's very interesting kind of a discourse like people will they don't like we let's have a really aggressive recruitment drive of male teachers into K twelve. Who thinks more men into K twelve would be a good idea? Almost nobody says no to that, right? I think it's a good idea, right? <laughs> you know, but then no one says anything. It's just what. So what happens is just like it just it just lands and like. But what is anyone going to do anything about it? Is that is anyone actually willing to spend any political capital pursuing that idea? Well, that remains to be seen because, and again, that's a great example because it's really uncomfortable for the left. Right, getting the teachers' union on board, spending money, say, to attract men, when all these women, it's tough. And the right are like, well, we think K twelve education is the problem anyway. Let's just have, let's just give everyone a voucher, Um, and the market will sort itself out. And actually, probably what happened is a lot of parents parents might choose schools that have more mix. I I have a friend who moved her kids very left wing, moved her kids out of public school into um, Catholic school, and. It was partly about the COVID thing, but she said, you know, one of the, she has sons and she said, there's a lot more men teaching at that school. And I think it's good for them to be around men. And this is a real liberal person. So, you know, I think that there is, there's demand there that's not being met. And hopefully you could find some or vocational education, even like the red shirting proposal, let's discuss that. And maybe there are better ways to help boys in education, but at least we're having the conversation then about how do we solve this problem rather than denying there's a problem in the first place. Well, Richard Reeves, uh, thank you again for joining me. Congratulations again on the publication of, of Boys and Men. And I really look forward to the national debate that I hope this book will start. Well, fingers crossed that you're doing your part. Thank you so much for that conversation. I loved it, Jeffrey. And thank you all for listening to the Vital Center podcast. Please subscribe and rate us on your preferred podcasting platform. And if you have any questions, comments, or other responses, please include them along with your rating or send us an email at contact at niscannoncenter.org. Thanks, as always, to our technical director, Christy Eshelman, our sound engineer, Ray Ingenieri, and the Scannon Center in Washington, D.C.